seal, I had the third beast say, come and see. And, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that ought not the oil and the wine. But the Lord God had blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Amen. So we continue to look at the unveiling of the seals. I hope we appreciate what we're doing so that you, we could just run through it like a, like a train. But that's not the way to gain revelation. So we're going this slowly so that it becomes part and parcel of us. Remember that it, remember that it was said that um, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. So it's not just an isolated message that we need to triumph. And I've said it severally that all of the promises that were given to the overcomers during the seven church ages, we benefit from all of them. Because we are not part of the seven church ages. We are out of the seven church ages. The seven church ages for us has ended. And so because we are out, we are graduates of the seven church ages, we are experiencing the only convocation of the bride of Christ. It means that we have faced everything that they, every godly and wonderful promises that they were promised. For example, we say, eat that overcometh, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life. He that overcometh, um, he will sit with me in my throne the same way I overcame and I'm set down with my father in his throne. He that overcometh, I will give him a white stone. Is that right? I will, um, it, it, so many promises. I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He said that he will be free from the second death. So many wonderful promises that were given to the overcomers. And we said that we are beneficiaries. For example, you see one of the promises given to the Philadelphian church age. He said that I will curse them that say they are of the synagogue of Satan and are not. I will curse them to worship at thy feet and to make them know that I have loved you. All of the, you, you would see that most of those promises, especially this one, where, wherein he said that I will protect you from the hour of temptation. The hour of temptation is still ahead. But this promise was given to the Philadelphian church age. Is that right? What I'm trying to say is that we become beneficiaries of all of these things in the Omega Bride age. So you will see why it is important that you need to hear what the Spirit said to the churches. Because we, have, we are the harvest. Is that right? We are the ones that graduated. We are the ones that are being convocated. So we are the ones that become beneficiaries of everything that they were promised. Is that right? And so we, we, we have that understanding. And so we, has, we had also looked at, um, I think as of now, we've looked at about five church ages. We've looked at Ephesus. We said Ephesus means to be aimed at. Is that right? But Abraham said, but it's also surprising that it also means to be what? Relaxed. So they were aimed at, and we said the reason is because they just came from um, an, the seed age, which was the Alpha Bride age. If you notice, the prime apostle, the one that was chief apostle in the Alpha Bride age, named Paul, became the messenger to the Ephes Ephesian church age. Is that right? So Ephesus, at, at the beginning, they were aimed at. They were very, very focused, right? They, they were watchful, and God commended them that you ate the deed of Nicolay things, which I also ate. But after some time, they became relaxed. Is that right? And then we got to Smina. We said Smina means bitterness or my. My, is that right? So we, we saw um, they, they were drifting way deep away from the perfect word that was here in the Alpha Age. So we got to Pegamos, and we say Pegamos means to be thoroughly married. That was where church and state 
married together. Is that right? And then we go to Tartaria, and Tartaria means continual sacrifice. Huh? It means continual sacrifice. And um, let us just see what Brother Bram said about that. Okay. The prophet said, Okay. Now, the Tartarian Church age, this is um, 8th of December 1960. Eight, you know, Brother Bram preached the ages before the brook was grammarized. I'm not if you remember. In the 1960s, Brother Bram preached the ages. It, was, it started from Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It began to build up like that. So that you will see some messages are titled Revelation chapter 5. Revelation, these are at the prophet built. So when he had done preaching these messages in the 1960s, then it was now, after that was when Leville was now commissioned to grammarize it. So Leville will be listening to the audio of the prophet and will be making notes, trying to put it in a more grammatically correct um, fashion. But after he was done, he would meet the prophet for the prophet to go through it to be sure that he has not deviated or added something different. Is that right? So you hear Brother Bram mentioning that about what they were doing as they were grammarizing. So this is from what we're going to read now is from the, the sermon that he preached. He titled it The Tartarian Church Age. Now in Paragraph 17, again, 8th of December, 1960. Paragraph 17. Are you there? Brother Abraham said, December 25th. He said, through that five days was when the Romans add their big celebrations, the circles, and so forth. And that's when they add this great pagan feast. And they put this man as a god himself up there and dressed him up and everything. And they had their god right with them. And that's when the post-millennium people come into existence right there because they thought the church was in the millennium. You know, we have those who are called the post-millennium people. We've talked about this before. We have, we, we are millennialists. We believe the millennial, millennium is ahead of us. Is that right? But we have those who are the post, they believe we, we the Catholic believe we're in the millennium right now. And that the Pope is the one that is seated in the, as king of Israel, the son of David ministry. They believe the Pope is the one fulfilling that. Because, of course, his name is the vicar of Christ, which means the one that is in the stead of Christ. So if you truly believe that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, then, of course, he's, he's, he's reigning right now as son of David, if that's what you believe. But we don't accept that doctrine. Pope is the one that represents or is the one that is, is on earth in the stead of Christ. We don't believe that. Is that right? So he's talking about those who are... The, the, the post-millennium people, they come into existence right there because they thought the church was in the millennium right there because the church was rich and they had need of nothing. Of course, we're going to see later why they were rich, how they became rich. So they had need of nothing, state and church all together. They say, oh, millennium is on. It's still a Catholic teaching till this day. See, now the millennium on for we know that that's wrong. That's wrong. The millennium, the second coming of Christ, brings the millennium. Do you believe that? Yeah. Now, but of course you know, it's very clear to you that most people in the message believe they are in the millennium. Hope you know that. There are some people in the message who believe they are in the millennium, which is a wrong doctrine. A very wrong doctrine. They believe that they were raptured in 1963 and that immediately they came back to the earth to live 
to, um, to have the millennium. That's what they believe. And then we have those who, um, many of them also believe that the Armageddon war has been fought. They believe that tribulation is over. The three and a half, these things were literal promises Brother Bram spoke about. But it's surprising that they believe all these funny things. And if you know, Paul contended with some of them. He said they were already preaching that the resurrection was past. So that same spirit is still here today. So if we're laughing the Catholics that they believe they're in the millennium, of course, we have very nice friends within the message corridors who believe the same thing. They believe they're in the millennium. They believe there are theophanies in them. These are different subjects that, by God's help, we're going to be looking at. Changing of the soul, uh, theophany, and many of all these concepts. The prophet said, the earth is groaning, crying for that day of sweet release. Is that right? Today, maybe the earth has stopped groaning, but we believe the earth is still groaning. We believe that what delivers the earth is the millennium. So you couldn't say that we're in millennium when we still have strife, we still have wars, we still have contentions, we still have battles, we still have the animals angry at us. That couldn't be millennium because we're told in the millennium the lamb and the lion will be playing together. So how could you say, nah, they spiritualize everything. And that's how the devil takes you away from becoming a participant of the millennium because it takes you to another reality. And I'm saying that that reality it takes you to becomes your lot. And so if you are so captured in that reality, which is an alternate and a very wrong reality, you can no longer become a beneficiary of what God will do when he does it. Because Brother Brown preached a message, things that are to be. They are to be. So we don't, you couldn't come to a point and say, and he told us how they will be. He told us they were literal events. Not things you will spiritualize. I saw somebody read a quote, he said, oh, Lenham is in us. Oh, Christ is the millennium. Yes, Christ is everything. But there is a time for the fulfillment. That's why we have the correct location of scriptures. Scriptures must not be misinterpreted. They must not be misplaced. They must not be dislocated. So when you dislocate a scripture, you do not just... Um, you've achieved something, huh? When you dislocate a scripture... You dislocate yourself also. You dislocate yourself. So when our Lord shall come back to earth again. Now, this great saint here was Columba. He was the messenger to the Tartarian church age. He was a great man of God. Now, I've got his history kind of written down here. First, the fourth church age, Tartaria, it means to be laxed. To be loose or easy. So you have somebody who is, who is laxed, relaxed, loose. It was just an illegitimate time from 606 to 1500 AD. The star was Columba from Ireland and Scotland, which was a nephew to St. Martin. Huh? So he, the messenger to the Tartarian church age, he was a nephew to the messenger to the previous church age, which was Pegamos. Is that right? Now, let's see another quote of the prophet. So we see here that that age means to be laxed to be relaxed, to be loosed. They were not um, strong people. That's how the Catholic Church could take over. Is that right? Because they, they have, having, been, having had state and church thoroughly married together in Pegamine, once they came to Tartaria, the people became relaxed and loosed. And so we had systems whereby, like we said previously, we had church taking over in Tartaria. You remember? The church was that Jezebel. He said, um, you, you entertain that woman Jezebel. That was one of the things that God had against them in Tartaria. And we said that woman Jezebel is the Roman Catholic Church. Hope you remember the way we, we traced it. We said in Ephesus it was the clergy over the laity. Is that right? In, in um, Smyrna it was the bishop over the clergy. In Pegamos it was the pope over the bishops. Is that right? And then we said in Tartaria, it was now church in government. You see the graduation. This is what you could call the depth of Satan. It was a movement from Nicolaitanism to Balamism, and then the next thing you can go into is Jezebelism, which was now church in power. Is that right? Now, if we also go to this book now, 
You will see what the prophet said about Tartaria. Okay. Now, Brother Bram said, he said, the word Tartaria has various meanings. Of course, we've mentioned some of them to be laxed, to be loosed. It has several meanings. Now, the prophet gives us one here. The word Tartaria has various meanings, amongst which is continual sacrifice. And all of these meanings, they have their place in. So we've seen laxed, loose. Another meaning is continual sacrifice. By, by many, this is believed to be a prophecy concerning the use of the mass, which is a continual presentation of the sacrifice of Christ. That is an excellent thought, but it might also mean the continual sacrifice in lives and labors of the true believers of the Lord. I think that's one that we can relate with. Because in Tartaria, we saw the beast of burden, which was the anointing that was released upon the bride of Christ, such that even though they were faced with the threat of death, they gave their lives willingly. Is that right? So that is continual sacrifice, and that's what Brother Bram is talking about. He says, surely these Tartarian saints were the cream of the crop, full of the Holy Ghost and faith, created unto good works, showing forth his praise, holding not their lives dear unto themselves, but gladly giving their all as a sweet sacrifice unto the Lord. So this was what they did, and um, of course it shows, you will see that the meaning of the ages, we could see it in the, in the lives of, and the experiences of the believers of those ages. Is that right? Of course we see in Tartaria was where we saw the launching of the Inquisition. Is that right? We saw it greatly in Tartaria. And I said that when the Inquisition was launched, it was the reason why the Bride of Christ began to escape. And we said that we could see that clearly in Revelation chapter 5. Because of course, I mean Revelation chapter 12. Because in Revelation chapter 12, we saw the Bride of Christ escaping. And I told you that in the escape of the Bride of Christ, we see two Two times it was stated. And I believe that the first one was the fact wherein they took sanctuary in some places of Europe that were not so um, open to the Inquisition and, uh, and the favors that they would have needed from the papacy. We saw that also there was the escape of a lot of them across the ocean to a glorious land that is currently called the United States of America. And I said that was very important because when we traced the messengers of the ages, we could see how that the gospel moved from east to west. Is that right? Initially, we said we saw Paul, he was a Jewish guy, and then we saw um, the next one was um, Irenus, came from Greece, and then we saw Martin, which came from where? Was it France? France. And then we saw um, Columba, Brother Banjo said he came from Northern Ireland or Ireland. Is that right? And Scotland, and then we saw Martin Luther, or let's say Luther, he came from Germany, and then we saw um, later um, Wesley that came from England. And then we said that you would see that at the end of it all, because some part of Europe you would say is, is west, but God now took it to the extreme west, which was across the ocean. And you will now see the reason why he ferried a lot of the members of the bride to take sanctuary in a, con in a place that there was not a country. And that's what we see in Revelation 13. A beast, I think Revelation 13 verse 11, a beast rising out of the land. The land symbolizes, the, or is in symbol, is opposite to the earth, or to the sea, sorry. Because the first beast of Revelation 13 in verse 1, it rises from the sea. And the Bible says the sea means thickness and multitude of people. Therefore, the land will have to be the opposite. The land has to be a place where you don't have thickness and multitude of people. The land has, and then when we look at the sea, we see various nations, even though many of them are very small. But when we go to the land, it means we're not going to see those kind of things. We're not going to see nations like that. And truly what we saw in the land was a forest. And then we had Indians living in various parts of the forest. 
And when the people who later became the Americans arrived, they took over the entire place. And then we said that it is not surprising that the last age messenger came from the United States. And so we could see out that the fact that it was his ancestors that left Europe fleeing persecution. Is that right? We said both they wanted religious freedom and economic freedom. And so when the beast rose, he rose with two horns. It was a, it was a buffalo beast. It was not a lamb, but it spoke like a lamb. It's, it rose the first time innocent as a lamb, separated state from what? Religion. Is that right? Separated state from religion. Which, of course, the age they were running from, it was, before that age, it was um, state and, and the religion thoroughly married. That was pegamy. So that's very clear. Is that right? And so now we, we now come to the Sardisian churches. But before we go there, let me go to the resume of the ages and see some of the things that the prophet said. As we try to... Okay? Now, in the resume of the ages, Brother Bram was making this point. He said, for the clergy to organize themselves, I've read this many times, but for the clergy to organize themselves with one rank over another until they are finally added up by a president. You know that spirit is still on the earth today, having rank over each other. And so you see a minister comes, he lies down flat before his spiritual father. Uh, he believes that that is how his ministry grows, and it works for them anyways. But it's a worship of man that we do not believe. It is the height of Nicolaitanism. That's what it means. The, the great height of Nicolaitanism and Balaamism. That's what it is. But, they, but you know, Satan will always make it... Um, you know, God said he will send them a strong delusion that they will believe the lie. So this is will be working for them and they will think that is the way it is. And then they will ask you, if it's, not, if it's not of God, how come it is working? Huh? That's why we don't believe that the means justifies the end. Huh? We don't believe that the means you went through, or sorry, the end, sorry, justifies the means, sorry. The end, the result you get does not justify how you got the result. So what we, that's why Brother Brown said that one of the mistakes they made was to go with experience instead of the word of God. So they went with their experience. Look, you could have a good experience, but it could just be you were lucky at that time. You can't use that experience as a doctrine. You can't use it as a doctrine. You may have been lucky at that point in time. But you'll be surprised that if somebody else went in that same experience, they will not get the result you got. But if it's scripture they followed, they will get the result all the time. That's why you can't use your experience to become a doctrine. But we have this system today that um, a lot of people are caught up in. They will tell you that if you want to have a great ministry, you must submit to somebody that has a great ministry. And so even if, if the person who has a great ministry is not doctrinally sound, you will have to submit to him because you want to have a great ministry. So they are thinking about their pocket. And that is not scriptural. Now we said for the clergy to organize themselves with one rank over another until they are finally added up by a precedent is a manifestation of the Antichrist spirit. Regardless of how wonderful and necessary it may seem. If you want to follow scripture, many a times you will have to fight with experience. I'm telling the truth. You will have to fight because you will see people who have gone the wrong way and they have excellent results. So even though it seems wonderful and necessary, if it's not scriptural, we don't follow it. We don't follow it. It is nothing but human reasoning taking the place of the word. And any person who is in the organized denominations is right in the midst of an antichrist system. Now let me say this and make it very plain. I am not against the people. I am against the system. With a church and state union, the stage has been set, the prophet said, for the dark ages. And indeed for about a thousand years, the church went into the depth of blackness, knowing the depths of Satan. When any religious people embrace both Nicolaitanism and Balaamism, and have the political, financial, and physical power to back it up, there is only one direction they can go. 
that direction is right into the Jezebel doctrine. Now, why do we say this? Because as we pointed out in the study of the fourth age, that Jezebel was a Sidonian, the daughter of Atbal, who was king priest to Astate. This, he was a murderer. This woman married Ahab, king of Israel, for political expediency. She then took over the religion of the people and murdered the Levites and erected temples wherein she caused the people to worship Astate, Venus, and Baal, the sun god. Hope you understand now, Astate, that's where you got Easter. It's, it's a celebration in honor of um, Easter. It's a celebration in, in honor of the Venus god. Are you with me? Then Christmas is a celebration of the sun god, which is Baal. This is why we don't celebrate these two feasts. If you told us Merry Christmas, we'll tell you God bless you. We don't tell you same to you. Huh? We don't tell nobody Merry Christmas. Even if you show us a quote, we don't tell nobody Merry Christmas. Huh? Do you understand that? We are practical people. I couldn't tell you Christmas is wrong and then I'll be telling you Merry Christmas. I mean, I don't understand. It's a celebration. It's a pagan celebration. It's a real pagan celebration. So she formulated the teaching and made a priest teach it. And they in turn, so you see Jezebel here, yeah, you can put the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church formulated the teaching and made a priest teach it. Are you seeing that? And they in turn made the people accept it. There you can see exactly what the nominal church was in the dark ages. They left the word of God entirely except for names and titles of Godhead and a few scriptural principles. They twisted what they did take out of the Bible by changing its meanings. Their college of bishops, Ectesera, wrote vast treaties. Their popes declared themselves infallible and said they received revelation from God and spoke as God to the people. All this was taught to the priests who, through fear, made the people believe it. To dissent was death or excommunication which might be worse than death. You know what this means? When you are excommunicated, you get no substance. You get no relief. That's his communication. So you'll be, you'll be wishing you were killed. Because you could be excommunicated. Even your family members will have nothing to do with you. You know that happens in, Mus in Islam. I, 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 you know, if you go to the northern part of this country, there are some families where a member of the family, is not, nobody knows where he is. Everybody thinks he's dead. He's not dead. They locked him somewhere. They shin the, the leg. Treat him like an animal because he wanted to convert to Christianity. So to them, it is an embarrassment if their family member becomes a Christian. So in order for him not to bring embarrassment, and maybe they felt they are saving him in their own imagination, they lock him up. I think we saw some, one time where the police came to rescue some people who have been there for like 10 years, locked by their family members. So you would, you would think that maybe it's better that they kill me. <laughs> huh? It's better they kill me. It was now the church with their short voice that took over. And wide with power, they drank the blood of the martyrs until the true Christians were all but exterminated and there was hardly any word left. And little manifestation of the Holy Ghost. But the true vine struggled and survived. God was faithful to the little flock. And in spite of what Rome might do to their bodies, Rome could not kill the spirit within them. And the light of the truth shone on, backed by the Holy Ghost and power. This is a good place to make an illuminating observation. Look, the deeds and doctrines of the Nicolaitans, the doctrine of Balaam, and the teaching of the first prophetess, Jezebel, do not constitute three spirits or make them three spiritual principles. These three are but the various manifestations of the same spirit. This is what we call the depth of Satan. As it goes from depth to what? Depth. What it all is, is the Antichrist spirit of organization in its three various stages. Once the clergy separated themselves and organized themselves, they oppressed the people by leading them into and binding them to organization also. This organization was based upon the creeds and dogma which they taught the people instead of the pure word of God. Ritual and ceremony was given an increasing part in worship. And soon, this old system was a militant and diabolical power that did its best
to control all through the persuasion of discourse or literal force. It received its energy from its own false prophecies and not the word of God. It was now absolutely antichrist, though it came in Christ's name. And what seemed an interminable time wherein truth must surely die, men began to protest. This is how we go into the Reformation. Men began to protest the vileness of the Roman Catholic Church. Because by no stretch of the imagination could God be in such teaching and such conduct. Because the people were so oppressed and, and so subjugated, many never even thought that how could God force you by, by the threat of death to join his system? Many never imagined. Huh? But God was getting his people ready. Because for a thousand years, it was state policy, church policy. And they believed they were backed by God. They believed they were backed by God. If you watch throughout the Old Testament, nowhere did God tell the Israelites to conquer anybody and force them to worship him. Nowhere. Nowhere. Nowhere did he do that. He said to kill them. Is that right? And take over the land. But not to force them to accept um, your religion. Most of those killed will even go to heaven. Eh? Hope you know that. Most of the Amalekites, the Jebusites that were killed, you thought all of them went to hell? No. Because even in the worship of idols, you had those who went by the conscience. And God will judge them by what? conscience. What does the community see to be right? That's how God will judge them. And you had people like that that were nice. Not every Amalekite was a devil. The same way, before Christianity came to Nigeria, your forefathers, you, you thought all of that generation went to, went to hell? I don't believe so. Paul said, those without the word will be judged by their what? Conscience. Because we serve a just and compassionate father. God does not judge without first warning. So why would God send them to hell? Where was the warning? The warning was what? Conscience. So it's not... Um, the same way, this is how you understand God. At the time, people who believe in three gods in one, huh? they were born again. Because that was the available truth. So that's the way God works. That's the way it works. So, but you know that state policy where they will have to kill if you don't join the religion. They will kill you. These protests were either disregarded and died from failure to arouse attention or were quashed by Rome. But then God, in his sovereign grace, sent a messenger by the name of Martin Luther. Is that right? To start a reformation. He worked in a climate where the Roman Catholic Church had been given so much rope that she was about to hang herself. Who gave her rope? God. She was about to hang herself. So when Luther preached justification by faith, not justification by church. By what? Faith. Salvation by what? Faith, not by church. Because what the Catholic Church did in that Tertullian church age was to try to tell the people that you can be saved by church. Do whatever you like. As long as you are a member of the church, you are what? Saved. But Luther came, that's not true. That's not true. It's by what? Faith. The first time we saw the scripture was in the book of Habakkuk. Justification is by what? Faith. Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to what? Please God. What is faith? Belief. Romans 4.3. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for what? Righteousness. His belief, righteousness became credited to him. If you want righteousness, seek God. Is that right? Believe him and his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things shall be what? Added unto you. you. So you seek God, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be what? Added unto you. Righteousness is a gift. It's a gift. It's not something that you work out. So when Luther preached justification by faith, the true vine for the first time in many centuries began to grow in a bountiful manner. As the nominal church had used state power to back it up, now state power began to flow against the Roman Catholic Church. 
You know why? Because you had the barbarians. In fact, there were a lot of conflict that was taking place in Europe at that time. And we said where Luther came from, he was so lucky that the... Because in Germany at that time, you need different territories to appoint who will be king. So the head of his territory was not so amenable to the Catholic doctrine. So Luther had that kind of protection in his territory. Nobody was giving him problem. Are you seeing something? Nobody was attacking him. So he had that freedom and God made that possible so that the reformation could grow. In fact, you will discover that the first printing press in the world was from Germany. Because that's where they began to print the Bible. Is that right? Before long, God brought about 47 men that looked at the original script and that was from the, on the basis of that we got the King James Version which is the most correct version of the Bible till date. All of this took place before this time. You can't. The Bible was taken from the people. They were told they did not have the faculty to understand it. That only the priests could do that. So they took the Bible from them and gave them whatever they wanted. But from this age, we saw the rise of the printing press. And of course, maybe the first time the printing press rose was for some other academic work. But it was God that was leading that charge so that the Bible could be printed in many copies and so that his elect can begin to see light from the darkness of the previous age. The prophet said, as the nominal church had used state power to back it up, now state power began to flow against it. And this is where Luther made his mistake. And the true believers, now notice something, what we're around to say. At the time, the Catholic church used state power. Now, Luther themselves also now began to use state power, which Brother Brown said was the mistake. They allowed the system to subsidize them. So this age did not launch out very far on the word. That's why they, they, they were not the restoration. That's why they were not the age of total restoration. They couldn't be because they allowed the state to subsidize them. It's a thank God that it did, it did go as far as it did, but because it leaned on political power to a great extent, this age ended in organization. And this very group that in Luther's generation had broken from the first vine, now turned back to become a daughter of the Allot, for she went right in, into Nicolaitanism. Look at it, the Lutheran church that came out, the Methodist church that came out from Wesley, they all have Nicolaitanism there. Huh? Nicolaitanism is still there. The Methodist church, they have uh, the hierarchical system of the clergy. They have one man, one headquarters somewhere. Are you seeing that? Because even though they were fighting the Jezebel system, they also went into it. But notice what God was doing. That was just the age of reformation. Restoration was still ahead. So they did their best, and it was important what they did. He said they went right into Nicolaitanism and Balaamism. This era had scores of factions within it. And to prove how far they were from the true seed is to merely read history and see how they persecuted each other. Are you seeing that? Even sometimes they killed each other. This was during the Sadistian church age we're looking at now. Are you listening? This is the age of man. Remember that the spirit that God raised to combat the Antichrist system was what? The face of a man. The face of a man speaks of wisdom, intellectualism. That's why the printed press rose. That's why many men came, went to the original scripture, the Greek, to bring the King James Version. It was wisdom of men. Brother said their shrewdness, their skill, education blossom. And this, if you notice, the Catholic Church in the Tartarian Church age was against education. They didn't want people to grow far in discovery because they felt that if this people went far in discovery, it will hurt the Roman Catholic Church. But God nonetheless released that spirit. And of course, like we said, using the political power, God changed the equation. The church that was, in, that was in the, on the throne in Tartarian church age was now having some of our, our tributaries countering their move. 
and this was God. And of course, those that began to counter their move were aligned to the reformists and the protestants. And in doing so, God was causing his bride to be reformed from the Catholic system. He said, can you go, let me read, get the thought of what I'm reading. He said, this era adds cause of factions within it. And to prove how far they were from the true seed is to merely read history and see how they persecuted each other, even unto death in some cases. But there was a few names amongst them, even as they always are in every age. God must have his witness that we not be caught up in the system. Is that right? We rejoice in this age for this one thing. Reformation had started. It was not a resurrection, but what? A reformation. Remember what, they are, what the fight is, what the face of a man is fighting. Because when the sound went forth, he said that they were, they were having a system wherein they were selling salvation. So you had something like this, you had a scale. Can you see that? In Revelation chapter, chapter 6, verse 5. He said, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny. Is that right? And three measures of barley for what? A penny. So what the Catholic Church was saying was that we will give you salvation. Huh? We will we'll, we'll exit your loved one from purgatory. We will forgive your sins. So this was, a, this was Jezebel. Is that right? You know, in the Tartarian church age, it was Jezebel. By the time it came to Sadis, Reverend said it, it became what? Atalia. Atalia was the daughter of who? Jezebel. So it came to Atalia, because we're talking about Sadisian church age now. Is that right? The third seal. So we now saw that he's trying to say, I will give you this and many more. All I need from you, bring your land. Huh? Bring your land. Bring your what? Your gold. Bring your gold. In some cases, bring your children. This was what they do. So they were prizing these things. How many land to get this? How many gold to bring your loved one from where? Purgatory. This is the pair of balances that he had in his hand. Are you seeing that? Now go back to the, to the quote. So he said reformation had started. It was not a resurrection. Because Omega Age is the resurrection. The resurrection. So you had reformation. After reformation you have what? Restoration. After restoration you now have what? Resurrection. These are the three arrows. Huh? The three what? Reformation, restoration, and then resurrection. He said, neither was it a what? Restoration. It was a reformation. It was not resurrection. It was not restoration. But the corn of wheat that had died at Nisye and had rotten in the dark ages now sent up a shoot of truth, signifying that at some future date, at the end of the Laodicean age, at the end, just before Jesus came, the church would go back to being a wheat seed bride again. 
while the tars will be harvested and burned in the lake of fire. Is that has that happened? Of course, to bind the to 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 burn the tars, they must first be what binded. What is the binding of the tars? The word council of what churches. So when all of them are going back to Mama in the word council of churches. Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria. That is the binding of the tars. They do not know that they have been binded for what? For the fire. But the true bread of Christ, like the wheat, is being gathered to the Ghana. That is what is happening. Since the fifth age had brought a great dissemination of the word through printing, the sixth one, which was Philadelphia, was quick to take advantage of it. So, Sadisian was justification by what? Faith. Not justification by the church. If I want salvation, if I want forgiveness of my sin, I don't need to trade my land. No, I need to believe. I am saved by my what? Faith in God's word. Not in the church. The church requires me to bring this. But if I need to be, and, and the salvation I'm given is a fake one. If I need to be saved truly, I don't need to let go of these things. All I need to do is to believe. God does not need these things from you. He needs you. Are you listening? What God needs is your complete submission to him. The Catholic Church never wanted them to be completely submitted. All they wanted was their property. This was how the Catholic Church became the richest organization of the world. It was mostly in the Sadistian church age. Are you listening? Doctrines they formulated in Tartaria, they began to merchandise them in Sadis. If you want the benefit, bring all these things. That's how they, they got the choicest land in the world. That's how they got the most quantity of gold in the world, was by selling these things. He had a pair of balances in his hand. This age was the second stage, the restoration. And as we have stated previously, it was the tassel age. Education abounded. Is that right? So what do you have? Sadis was what? Was shoot. Is that right? Philadelphia was what? Tassel. Of course, Philadelphia means brotherly brotherly love. That's the meaning of Philadelphia. It means brotherly love. So he said the yeah, education abounded. In fact, so in Sardis we saw justification by faith. When we go to Philadelphia, we now have the return of holiness. Holiness. Because in the previous age we have pornocracy. Pornocracy means when in the papacy they brought life sexual event into the Vatican. That was what was happening in the Dark Ages. Of course, we're, we're told that the priest doesn't marry. But they began to do all kinds of things. They didn't care. There was so much darkness. So light was coming. And so education abounded in Philadelphia. The prophet said, this was the age of intellectual men who loved God and served them. So we have people like John Wesley. We have people like Calvin. We have people like Finney. We have people like Knox. Is that right? We have all these great men rising, great knowledge, and God was using them extensively. He said missionaries abounded. It was in West's age we saw the launch of missionaries. It abounded, and the word spread over the world. It was an age of brotherly love. It was an age of the open door. Is that what the Bible said? He said, I give you an open door which no man can shut. God was opening the doors to them. Doors that were previously closed by the Catholic system. God was making them open so that the gospel could, could flourish. It was the last age of long duration. And after it, the Laodicean age would come, which would be a short one. The true vine flourished in this age as in no other. When one thinks of numbers at home and abroad, this age brought only men to the forefront. Only men. In this age, you see men fasting long. Fasting very long in this age. It was the age of consecration, holiness. The true vine spread and the first vine receded. Everywhere the true vine went, God gave light and life and happiness. The first vine was shown up for what it was. Darkness, misery, poverty, illiteracy, 
and death. And as the first vine in its days of power could not kill the true vine, neither could the true vine now bring the first vine to Jesus Christ. But the first vine entrenched itself, waiting for the last part of the last age when it would win all back to itself, except the fo- small flock that was, that were the elect, the true vine of God. You understand that last statement of the prophet? Huh? Through the instrumentality of the WCC, it's wherein the first vine is gathering them to itself. Even the big churches like Deeper Life and all of those who claim to be separate, they are all wound up in the system. They all wound up. One way or the other, they are caught up in Trinitarianism. They are caught up in all kinds of things. Remember that when the sixth fire was open, three unclean spirits came out. Is that right? And he said to gather the people to Armageddon. Anyone that is not caught up in the mystery of the seventh seal will become a victim for the capture of three unclean spirits. But thank God for revelation. If not for revelation, we would have been in this system. And look at how dark it is. You could show people, a lot of people, the history of their denomination in this, and they will still not come out. He said, but my sheep will hear my voice. Anyone who has shown this, you see the generation, the things that happened, what your church did. Why should you still be in that system? Could you imagine the Anglican church? Their creed and dogmas was written by a drunken, ag- angry king, Henry, King Henry of the Tudor dynasty. Because the Catholic church would not allow him to have a divorce, he decided to break away from the Catholic church. But I said that was the anger of a man praising God. Because that was the beginning, the, the fracture that you began to see, wherein a state broke away from the Catholic church. And then, we saw that in that form, his own church, Anglican church, that's why you saw that the, the head of the Anglican church became the king, the king of England before all the churches were headed by the Pope. But he said, how could one Pope seated in Rome tell my churches what to do? He became head. And then he wrote their creed and their dogmas. And you'll be surprised that till date, some people still believe that. Thank God for revelation. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We appreciate you, Lord, for insight. We're so grateful, Lord, that we are not subjugated in this system. It is not by our power. It is not by our might. It is the working of predestination. It's predestination that has brought us this far. It's not our prayers. It's not anything that we do. It's predestination that has brought us this far and has kept us away from the influences of these spirits. As we go into the rest of the service, Lord, we're in great expectation. Have your way, blessed Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.